If you really think about stereoisomerism, you'll realize that it's a property of shape. It's not strictly a property of, for instance, stereocenters that are carbon or asymmetric carbon atoms. Because it's a property of shape, in theory, any molecule that can, or any atom, excuse me, that can assume a tetrahedral or trigonal planar geometry can exhibit stereoisomerism. And we see this in practice. So as long as we can suppress racemization, we can observe, for instance, the two enantiomers of an amine with three different groups attached to it. So you'll notice in the amine that I've drawn here, this is essentially a chiral amine with an asymmetric nitrogen here, nitrogen that's a stereocenter. Think of the lone pair as a group in and of itself. So this nitrogen is, in, in a sense, a tetrahedral atom with four different groups attached. It's got an ethyl, a methyl, a phenyl, and a lone pair. Umbrella flipping of the nitrogen generates its enantiomer. The problem with isolating pure enantiomers of amines is that the umbrella flip process is so rapid that, for all intents and purposes, on average, the nitrogen is planar because half the time it spends its time in one umbrella form, the other half of the time it spends its time in the other umbrella form. So on average, it's essentially flat. And actually, this turns out to simplify a lot of compounds containing amines, because we don't have to worry about stereoisomerism. However, there are exceptions. Um, the third row elements in particular can be configurationally stable in tetrahedral or trigonal planar geometry. So what you're looking at here are two chiral molecules, uh, one a phosphine on the left here, and then a sulfoxide here. I guess on your right is a phosphine, and on your left is a sulfoxide. And these are two chiral molecules. Four different groups are attached to the phosphorus and sulfur atoms of these molecules. And they're configurationally stable, so they're processes of racemization. For instance, umbrella flip, in the case of the phosphine, is much more difficult uh, at room temperature. And actually, as you saw in the section on resolution, we can, if we can produce those molecules in an antiomerically pure form, we can harness them to make compounds containing carbon, right, more traditional organic molecules, drugs, and the like, that are enantiomerically pure by resolution. So producing these molecules in pure form is actually a great research, uh, research interest of organic chemists right now. So this brings us to the end of chapter two on stereoisomerism. And in these last few minutes, I just wanted to summarize the chapter and really hit the key points of what we've learned thus far. So let me get out of the way here a little bit. So the first thing we touched on was this idea of isomerism, right? It's important to remember that it's a relation between molecules. It's not a property of molecules. So we can look at two molecules and say, are they isomers or not? But we can't look at a molecule, not in any other context, and ask, is it an isomer or not? And that applies to every subclass of isomers. So stereoisomers and regioisomers, we can see later, are all relations and not properties of molecules necessarily. We looked in great detail at stereoisomers in this chapter, which have the same connectivity but different shape, and we classified stereoisomers into two types, diastereomers and enantiomers. If a molecule possesses this property of being handed, then it possesses an enantiomer. That is, it possesses a molecule, which is its mirror image. We can obtain the enantiomer simply by taking the mirror image of a handed molecule, just as we can with the two hands, right? But those mirror images are non-superimposable, and that's the key point in the definition of an antimer, that the mirror images are non-superimposable. Achiral molecules, on the other hand, if you do that same process of reflecting them through a mirror, then you'll simply get the same molecule out. So for instance, the mouse I'm holding in my hand right now is an example of an achiral molecule or an achiral object, I guess we should say. It's got a plane of symmetry right here. Remember, we identified planes of symmetry and inversion centers as the primary elements of symmetry that allow us to identify a molecule as a chiral. And that's important because chirality brings along with it some complications in terms of both reactivity and physical properties that we talked about. So 
chirality manifests itself physically as optical rotation, right? What we talked about at the beginning of today in terms of chiral non racemic molecules having the ability to rotate plane polarized light by affecting those chiral helices in different ways. Last thing we touched on was the energy of stereoisomers and the fact that diastereomers have unequal energies and react differently, while enantiomers have equal energies and react in the absence of any other chiral non racemic influence exactly the same. But that's the trick to separating enantiomers, is turning enantiomers into diastereomers by treating them with a separate chiral source. So optical rotation, in a sense, is that same idea. You take a pure enantiomer of a chiral source of light and treat it with this your pure enantiomer, and the result is rotation of the light, an effect on the light unequal in the two helices, right? So in order to separate enantiomers, the trick is to convert them into diastereomers and then operate on them. So hopefully you've enjoyed this chapter on stereochemistry. That's all I've got for you today, but next time we're going to look at the cycloalkanes. And the cycloalkanes are going to kind of serve as more of a case study of uh, what we've learned so far in terms of general principles. So we'll talk about nomenclature and bonding and orbitals in the cycloalkanes, and then we'll transition into um, studies of stereochemistry. So you may not necessarily learn anything new other than a few interesting facts about the cycloalkanes, but what you will be able to do is apply your knowledge to a particular case study that really, I think, nicely illustrates the principles that we've learned in the first two chapters. So hopefully I'll see you next time. Otherwise, thanks for joining us today, and uh, that's all we've got. Appreciate it.